Hi, my name is Dr Catherine Hughes from Crime Psych. I'm a criminal psychologist and today's video is going to be one of a series of videos talking about the psychology of place and how that can be used to understand serial criminal behaviour. It's no easy task to tackle such a vast area of research and I only hope that I can do Professor David Cantor's work justice in a concise but understandable manner. In this first video, I'm going to be talking about the psychology of place in a general way and what the subject itself is all about. Then I'll talk about how we use and how we understand the spaces that we live, work and socialise in. It's only then that I can even begin to talk about how that can be of use when examining offending behaviour. There are a vast number of different studies in a wide range of areas which are concerned with how we make sense of and use our surroundings. These can be studies in areas such as geography, planning, psychology, architecture and urban sociology. Studies in these areas are all concerned with how people make sense of and cope with their surroundings. In order to provide a useful insight, these studies need to consider whether they're concerned with points on a map, design of nature trails, design of office layout, transport systems, travel and many more. To do this, we need to have a macro and a micro focus and understand whether the need is to understand how people um, conceptualise their use of space, our perception of space or a general location. Our perception of place can change depending on how much information we have available on it. Let's use the example of buying a house. People tend to view a number of houses before settling on one choice. We then have to relate what we see and imagine what it would be like to live there based on our needs. When we go look at the next house, we go through the same process and what we imagine will be different and change based on the information that we have. To explain that more simply, imagine, for example, you're looking to buy a three bedroom house within an hour's commute to work. You also love the idea of having a garden and a bigger kitchen. You look at house number one which has three bedrooms, is only half an hour commute to work, but has no garden and a small kitchen. The second house you look at is a two bedroom and is one and a half hour commute, but has a big garden. The third house is, has a big kitchen, a big garden, but is a two hour commute. You then have to modify what's important to you within those spaces. Is it worth spending more time commuting for more space? Which is more important, the number of bedrooms or the kitchen size? In an early study by Bateman and colleagues in 1974, he asked people moving out of London to Plymouth to indicate on a map where they would not like to live. Their level of dislike was measured numerically by different areas and that produced a map of the least desirable and more desirable areas that they wanted to live in. The centre of the city shows the greatest amount of dislike, but this level slopes away most rapidly to the sea, but less rapidly inland. And this map revealed that the nearer to the city, the less people would prefer to live there. They're more willing to live closer to the city if it meant nearer to the beach than inland. And that early work gave some insight into how we think about and represent space in our minds. The way that we perceive space can be different to the way that it actually is. For example, we can underestimate or overestimate distances. Some features can become natural barriers to the way in which we perceive space. As early as 1947, a geographer named Wright highlighted that studies should focus on how the world is perceived rather than the way it actually is. The ways that we think about our space plays an important part in how we use it. These cognitive representations of space and environment can be complex and are subject to change. Bartlett made some significant advances in understanding these by playing what I can only describe as a cross between Pictionary and Chinese whispers. A person is given a picture or a story and has to memorise it and then reproduce it for the next person. 
that person has to then draw from memory to the next person and so on. In the end, the image might look nothing like the first one. Bartlett wrote the following. Whenever material visually presented purports to be representative of some common object, but contains certain features which are unfamiliar in the community to which the material is introduced, these features invariably suffer transformation in the direction of the familiar. The whole series shows how speedily a pictorial representation might change all of its leading characteristics in the direction of some schematic form already current in the group of subjects who attempt its reproduction. So this study showed that we have an internal representation that we use as a reference point when attempting to reproduce pictures. These representations can help to make sense of new or novel information. If I was shown a picture of a female, I'd be able to make a distinction between an adult and a baby. However, if some of the features were distorted in some way, I'd make a best guess on what I knew about the way that babies or adults look like. For example, I know that babies tend to have rounder faces, fuller cheeks, less hair, bigger eyes and so on. And we do exactly the same thing when using space. For example, when finding our way around new places. We might not do this in a conscious way though. It was some years after that first study that this idea of schemas was applied to the physical environment. Bartlett's student, Lee, proposed that there was a continuous input of information in neighbourhoods, towns and cities. There are aspects such as buildings, bicycles, parks, shops, pubs, transport and so on. Within a person's mind, some aspects of it will be more relevant than others. Somebody, for example, who works in an office in the city centre will have a different representation of the transport system because they're more familiar with it than somebody who jogs in the park outside of the city centre, for instance. However, if that jogger then got a job in the city centre, their expectations about travel time will then be modified. If the office worker began to jog, they wouldn't know how far they could jog before they got too tired. In this way, expectations and memory will be important factors to understand in the new space. Places can also hold an emotional significance to us. In his book, The Psychology of Place, David Cantor notes how Proust writes about a time he remembers fondly. And Proust writes, The sensation I had once felt on two uneven slats in the baptistry of St Mark had given back to me and was linked with all of the other sensations of that and other days which had lingered expectant in their place among the series of forgotten years from which a sudden change had imperiously called them forth. And that was by Proust in 1957 on pages 210-211. Most people will remember a place, a place that they've lived, maybe. This could come with either positive or negative emotions attached to that place. Do you remember where you were when you had your first kiss, for example? Maybe you remember a place of work that you loved. We attach emotional significance to places. Aspects of that place can bring about memories of it. Maybe you see the Eiffel Tower, for example, and fondly remember where you stood, the view, the smell that remind you of when your partner proposed to you. It could even be negative emotions. You might see a park bench that looked just like the one where your first boyfriend or girlfriend broke up with you. I'll leave this video at this point for now and in the next video I'll move on to how we quantify the space around us and how we think about distance and mental maps. Thanks for watching, hope you found this video interesting. Bye for now.